Good evening, everyone. I'm Laura Ingram. This is The Ingram Angle from Washington tonight. OJ's real legacy. That's the focus of tonight's angle. At USC, on the field, he ran like the wind, a phenomenon. Back in 1968, Simpson was the best player in all of college football. It's why he won the trophy and why USC won one as well. Heisman Trophy winning, Pro Football Hall of Fame running back, nine seasons with the Bills, two with the San Francisco 49ers. Just a stunning legacy. Had he not been charged in the gruesome double murder of his ex-wife Nicole Brown Simpson and her friend Ron Goldman in what became known as the trial of the century. Now, in October 1995, despite damning DNA evidence, he was ultimately acquitted. Now, I remember my days uh, sitting back in my law office, that's how long ago it was, and everyone was glued to their TV screens, partners, associates, secretaries. Now, most of us were stunned that he got off. We were shocked. But the press and the so-called civil rights activists had seized on this case to encourage racial division. Now, think about it. O.J. was one of the most beloved figures in American sports. And at the time, he was part of sports lore and history. And these people tried to convince black America that the only reason he was charged was because he was black? Yeah, that happened. No wonder the reaction to the not guilty verdict elicited reactions like these. Now, some background here for those of you who weren't around at the time. Now, this was a few years after the L.A. riots that followed the acquittal of police officers in the beating of Rodney King, after Rodney King had led police on a high-speed chase. Now, they called Rodney King a motorist in a lot of headlines, but there was a lot more to it at the time. But to some, O.J.'s not guilty verdict was kind of a moment of racial payback. Now, this was a terrible narrative to feed our young people at the time, because rather than focusing on the facts of the crime, the motive, the testimony of those involved, everyone was riveted to their TV screens, the case became tangled up in a poisonous racial narrative that we've been stuck in ever since, including in the case of Dexter Reed, who was shot and killed in an altercation with police on March 21st. Roll the windows down. Roll the window down, man. Roll the window down. What are you doing? Roll this one down. Roll that one down too. Right. Hey, don't roll the window up. I'm don't roll the window up. Okay, okay. Do not roll the window up. Hey, do not roll Unlock the doors up. now. Door. Unlock the doors Open now. Door. Unlock the doors door. now. Hey, Open the door I'm now. Sorry. Open the door now. Yeah. Open the door now. The media's framing of this was predictable. Now, here are the headlines. 96 shots in 41 seconds, killing black man during traffic stop. Seatbelt violation ends with black man dead. Now, if you read these types of headlines, of course, it sounds horrific, awful. Many would reasonably conclude that the police response must have somehow been racially motivated. And the coverage, of course, is intended to keep throwing matches on the flammable liquid. The individual shot is always portrayed as the perfect child. Reed was 26 years old, previously a basketball standout at Westinghouse High School, leading the team to a regional championship. His mother said he loved to cook and wanted to pursue a career in broadcasting. He had just bought his new car three days before that. And he was just riding around in his car. He said, Mom, I'm going for a ride. And they killed him. They killed him. <laughs> Again, seeing these reports and a grieving mother, you can't blame people for being really upset. We don't need armed police officers to tell somebody to put their seatbelt on. Dexter's vehicle had tinted windows, so the argument that they were looking for a seatbelt issue doesn't make sense. They fire away 96 times in 41 seconds. They fire away... 
40 times on an unarmed man outside his vehicle. But the truth, well, reports show that Reed was not just a motorist dealing with a seatbelt issue. After refusing to exit the car or open his door, as police repeatedly instructed him to do, initial reports show that he actually shot at police first and even hitting one of them in the arm. So my question is, you know, we'll see a full investigation, but what are these law enforcement officers supposed to do in this type of situation? Just allow themselves to be gunned down, risk being gunned down? just to prove they're not racist to Benjamin Crump or whichever lawyer stands to make millions in cases like this? Let's face it. Since OJ, the media and top Democrats have shown us how dedicated they are to keeping America racially divided. Always assume the worst about people, especially their motives. Why else would they admit, omit key facts in their reporting, their discussions about these cases, or ignore the full context of what happens before police use force against a suspect. Everyone remembers, I think, the Michael Brown case in Ferguson in Missouri. Remember, they lit that city up on fire in riots, but hands up, don't shoot. Remember, that became the motto of those going after police and their response. It was poor Michael Brown. He was a choir boy. He was gunned down when trying to surrender. Hands up, don't shoot. Well, it was all made up never happened. The police officer's life was ruined, even though he was cleared by the DOJ. Now, the last thing, any of these racial arsonists who know better but continue to stoke the flames of racism, the last thing they want is for all the working people from all races and ethnicities to come together in one movement, demand better for cities and communities and crime and the economy. By the way, that's what Trump is trying to build right now, that new multiracial and ethnic coalition. And it looks like it's working. Look at this journal headline today. Wow. Biden's inflation, the high prices, the border. It's all so bad for the Democrats. Predictable racial propaganda stuff just isn't working anymore. More black men are moving away from Biden. Now, instead of changing their horrible policies, Democrats choose to seize on cases like the Reed shooting, see if they could get some juice on that. And come election time, they will promise things like racial justice or announce an equity action plan. Yeah, they did that at the Labor Department. And a pathetic attempt to reassure black voters that they're on their side. But none of this, no racial equity conferences or anything of the like, will stop gang violence in inner cities or help families afford their first home or bring down the price of gas or make public schools better. Not for African Americans, not for anyone in this country. It does nothing except poison the well of conversation and community. So OJ Simpson's legacy is tragic. But we now have a chance to build a better country if we stop letting powerful people divide us by race, or ethnicity, or any other category, because that only leaves all of us weaker, poorer, and angrier. The time has come for a multiracial, 50-state populist movement to stand up for America and for all the working people who deserve a hell of a lot better. And that's the angle. Hey, Sean Hannity here. Hey, click here to subscribe to Fox News' YouTube page and catch our hottest interviews and most compelling analysis. You will not get it anywhere else.